All right. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this discussion on AI and no code. My name is Nibby. I am on the AI team at Bubble, and I am very excited to be here. I hope that all of you are excited to be here. As Josh and Emmanuel mentioned in their keynote, there's been quite a bit of excitement about AI this year. And we've been asked repeatedly about how AI is impacting platforms like Bubble. And we've also been asked, is AI going to make no-code irrelevant? And so to answer some of these questions, we've brought in some industry leaders here today. Thank you so much for being here. I am very excited to introduce Scott Belsky, Chief Strategy Officer and EVP Design and Emerging Products at Adobe. <laughs> Shishir Mehrotra, Co-Founder and CEO at Coda. And Emmanuel, co-founder and co-CEO at Bubble. Thank you again so much for being here. Let's dive right in. Why don't we start by having each of you describe your vision of no code at your company and how you see AI fitting, fitting into that vision. Go, go ahead. I'll go, I'll go first. Yeah. <laughs> we were talking about that just a few minutes ago, but. The mission of Bubble is to really reduce the cost of creating technology. Uh, we think that software is a very expensive product that can make a lot of great good for a lot of people, but they just can't afford it. And so by, through a visual interface, we have a way to expand the pool of people that can build software and therefore reduce the cost dramatically. And so AI, to me, does exactly the same thing in a sense that it enables people to do more with less uh, with a machine that is going to get smarter uh, so that more people can use more sophisticated things. Uh, and where I think it gets really excited for us, uh, and no code and AI together, is that AI ultimately is never as good as uh, the format that it gives you when you ask AI a question. And so AI generating code is cool, but it's cool if you're a coder. AI generating no code, and Bubble in particular in, in our world, is extremely exciting because suddenly you can, you know, through um, a conversational uh, medium, generate something that you can start, use, and modify uh, visually which is really exciting. Yeah, so um, I think code and bubble are like kind of opposite ends of this, uh, how we think about no code. So I often get asked to compare, and the way I would think about it is, you know, tools like bubble are about making it, making it as, uh, building apps as easy as writing docs, is kind of one way to say it. And code is the opposite, where we want to make docs as powerful as apps. And so people think about, uh, when we think about AI, and we think about, uh, things like low code, so on. It kind of comes from the other perspective. Code is used primarily as a document surface that happens to be able to, to uh, use AI to do more things. And so for us, AI is first off much more in the knowledge worker experience. So it's an experience for how do I find things, how do I summarize things, how do I write things, and so on. Um, but the most important thing for us is AI becomes a building block in that experience. And so we see lots of people use AI to, to really do things. So uh, last year, in the last year, we've done about four billion tasks have been automated in uh, in Coda through AI and all of our integrations and automations and so on. So I think about AI as an enabler for all those people as a new building block. Yeah, and I think for us, I mean, different answers maybe I guess on the no code versus the AI side, but there's some some overlaps. Uh, I mean, first of all, at Adobe, one of the things that I've been on a mission on over the last six years is to help us build a platform that lets the teams that are like really focused on things like imaging and video and you know really at the edge of their category make new technology and make it available to everyone else internally um, and uh, and and a lot of that is you know through experimentation and a lot of this you know to me no code means empowerment you know low code means anyone enabling you know enabling any individual um, person with an idea to start to like light up and test something, integrate some capability into, you know, into one of our products. So that's been, I think, a big part of us having more of an experimentation culture. As it relates to AI, I mean, my goodness, I think that for the world of creativity, which is where I sit, I mean, it's just, uh, 
it's just like the perfect storm for us in a good way. I mean, all the hallucination problems that a lot of companies are still dealing with, with LLMs and that sort of thing, well, guess what? For creativity, hallucination is not a bug, it's a feature. Um, you know, our customers want tons of variations. They, Isaac Gizrahi, the uh, famous fashion designer, once said that creativity is a mistake of the eye. And I feel like in some ways, the hallucination of these models is that as a service. And, uh, and it's been really fun to see the creative world kind of embrace this stuff to find, you know, to explore more surface area of possibility to find better solutions to the problems they're facing. But that's the thing, right? Is that ultimately all of our, every, every engineer is ultimately trying to solve a problem. And if they can, if they can explain it, or any product manager for that matter, or anyone, you know, in customer service, if they can just sort of with natural language explain the problem they're trying to solve and get an application in return, like that's just super empowering. Yeah, I really like what you said about how no code is empowerment. And overall, what I'm hearing is that there seems to be this almost natural partnership between low code, no code, and AI. So I would love to dive a little bit more into that and hear what you think are some of the really concrete biggest benefits of AI in the overall low code, no code space, and maybe some of the more concerning risks. Hmm. I mean, I, maybe I can start and uh, give a quick version on both. I mean, uh, for, for us, I think, the the real opportunity with AI is to go beyond answering questions, generating ideas, and, and performing tasks for people. That's both really incredible, um, but it's also really scary because you can now have systems that can do many things that um, you know. I've seen people like obvious use cases we see a lot are use AI to generate and send emails, send Slack messages, so on, uh, create tickets. Um, but you can you know you can use AI to go and send packages to places, and you can imagine what happens when it gets that wrong. Um, as, as an example. Uh, I mean, on the risk side, the other thing I'd say is, um, I think we talk a lot about hallucinations, which is an obvious risk in some applications. I think similarly, for us, I wouldn't say it's a feature, but it's not as big a, uh, as big a problem as it is for some other applications. Um, but I do think data privacy is a really interesting challenge. Is it's Especially in the workplace, the expectations are that AI understands something about the data in my workplace. And I think up till now, most people have focused on a promise of, you know, you're, we don't train on your data, which is like I, in my mind the bare minimum of what you can say. Um, but they're also like really interesting. Uh, you know, we get prompts all the time in in Code AI things like who's getting promoted this week, and you have to you have to be able to give the correct answer to a question like that. So how do you how do you protect information inside a company as well? I think it's been an interesting challenge. Um, I mean. What we're trying to do with uh, AI for a platform like ours is really accelerate the building process. And there's still a few repetitive things that people have to do when they build applications uh, on Bubble. And I think that's where there is uh, a ton of potential by literally making software finally uh, as easy as speaking, where you, you would either speak or type uh, a prompt, and then we can build something for you uh, very quickly. Uh, and that's where, we, uh, heading, uh, that's where we're heading. In terms of risks, um, I see two that are like pretty specific to the bubble world. The first one is um, on the, the way we train model and biases, because um, we created bubbles so that not all applications look the same. Like in fact, compared to pretty much all the other tools that help people build, uh, enable people to build uh, websites or applications on the market without code, often you would say that you know all these things created look pretty similar. And so there is a risk with AI to go back into this if people, if the AI that uh, Bubble AI starts generating always the same thing, then we have an issue here. And so that's something we're paying a lot of attention. The second risk um, is for our ecosystem. Like there are a lot of people, including here, that make a living building websites uh, or web apps for people. And we want to make sure that you know we don't harm their businesses in the very short term. In the long term, I'm not too concerned because I think the need for software is so big that we'll all be fine uh, by creating uh, software for people. But I couldn't imagine an impact in the short term. Yeah, I mean, for us, AI is um, it's kind of done this strange thing where it's both simultaneously lowered the floor and raised the ceiling. And it's lowered the floor in the sense that far more people are now able to come into some of our products and actually get something done. You know, Photoshop was a real, it's like a cockpit when you open it. It's really complicated for a lot of people. And it takes, you know, sometimes hours of YouTube videos to really learn how to use all the instrumentation. Now, we have, a, uh, we have this generative fill progressively disclosed bar everywhere you put your cursor, and you can just like summon things and make natural language edits, essentially, to imagery. 
and it's um, you know it's, it's really lowered the floor. More people can come in. Uh, it's also raised the ceiling in the sense that creative professionals can now like hop, skip, and jump through their workflow, and they can get a lot more done more quickly. They can explore a lot more possibilities for every you know every proposal that they send to their client or you know or, or choose as a solution to a problem, and so that's like super super empowering as well. I would say I mean the biggest concern I've had is really about again, I'm talking from the world where AI is enabling creators, is that we're entering a world where we can no longer believe our eyes. Mm -hmm. Like people can create any sort of synthetic anything now with tools today, and it's just gonna get much, much, much better. And so we're gonna have to have some solutions to also help us navigate a world where we actually, you know, the new trust but verify is gonna be verify then trust. Like we're gonna wanna know how something was made in order to determine whether we can trust it. And that's like a world I'm trying to figure out, you know, with my teams, like how we can help people get ready for that. Yeah, yeah I think that naturally with this technology as advanced as AI, that's almost kind of mysterious. It's almost a little bit difficult to understand. There are bound to be many concerns and many questions. And so hopefully we can try to alleviate some of those concerns as you all kind of just did. Is there something that you've seen the public be quite concerned about AI that maybe you are not as worried about? Well, I mean, I'll just kick us off. I mean, this is a topic we're all thinking about all the time. I mean, number one, number one, two, and three concerns right now are probably around job loss. I guess that's after ending the world. I don't, I don't buy <laughs> into that. Um, I, I think, I, I, but I, but the job loss thing, you know, there's a lot of conversation about that, and I think a lot about this. So, um, you know, we we had some economists do a bunch of work around the increase in productivity for developers every year over the last few decades. And guess what? People want to hire even more engineers, more developers. Why? Because they can get more per person. And as humans and as companies that want to build more, we end up being like, wow, if we can get more per person, we could actually, we should get more people. So instead of having three products, we can have four products. Instead of you know, making this available in seven regions, we can make it in 12 regions. Like that's just, just like the, it's the human tendency, I guess, is to want to be able to make more. Um, and I think on the creative professional side too, a lot of the creative, professional, mundane, repetitive work is being automated by AI now, and that's liberating people to be able to do like higher order work. And for creative professionals, that means better digital experiences, like stuff that actually makes us look. And when every brand starts flooding the zone with endless amounts of generated content, um, likely hyper-personalized for each of us, I actually think the bar is going to go up, and we're going to want to end up hiring even more creators to even beat or you know, exceed that bar. So it's a bit contrarian because I think everyone's just assuming that with productivity means fewer people, but actually history suggests otherwise. Yeah, I strongly agree with that. I mean, I think the, the history of productivity actually leading to that kind of job loss is, is, is you know, we predicted it many, many times over. Um, uh, I'm, in, I'm usually based in San Francisco. I'm here today for uh, on the board of Spotify, and so we've talked a lot about it in the creative uh, realm as well. And one of the analogies that was made there is the when electronic music started coming out, all, all of a sudden people's viewpoint was like, "Oh, this is going to kill music. It's like there's no creativity here. There's like, you know, the, the 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 synthesizer can generate everything." And of course, that's not what happened at all. And we have a whole genre of music that is different. So I think not only do jobs you know, get created, they shift to so what, what types of things you can do. And all of a sudden, you're going to have Photoshop with this higher ceiling, and it's going to um, enable a whole new class of creatives, right. which I think is really interesting. I mean, in terms of things I think people are worried about that I'm less worried about, I think hallucination is one I worry less about. I mean, I think it's, um, there's definitely cases uh, for it, but I think, you know, most of the examples that are given tend to be using AI in a way that is kind of, you should know better. Um, and uh, I think if you ask the internet a question, sometimes the internet tells you the truth, sometimes it doesn't. Most these systems are based off the internet, and that's, you know, that's what it's going to do. Um, so I'm probably a little less worried about that. Um, I think I am probably more worried about, as the thing Scott mentioned, is, is understanding fake from reality, understanding provenance, understanding ownership. Um, you know, I spent a long time before starting code at YouTube, and one of the, the keys to our success was we built a system called Content ID, which allowed every time you uploaded a video, we would tell you whether it was a copy of anything anybody owned. But the library of what we started with was like in relative terms, tiny. I mean, it was, right. it was a few hundred thousand things that we had to start with. And nowadays you're gonna have to like do this many to many match of anything that's ever been created. You know, how is it a derivative of this other thing? And, and so I think that 
you know, what's fake and what's not and who deserves credit, I think is going to be a really interesting challenge with AI. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think both, both, uh, both topics are actually very valid responses to this question. I'll come with a different uh, response here uh, around copyright, actually, and uh, the fact that models are being trained on like data that, and assets that have been created by people. Um, I think I hear there are a lot of concern about this. And I do think there is a risk to get it wrong, but there is also a way to get it right uh, if we manage to abstract data enough as you train models. Um, and, th and that's what, one of the reasons we're taking our time here, because we want to make sure we do that the right way. Uh, and the analogy I would use uh, here is, you know, if, if you're an artist and you're creating something, you are being inspired by, you know, the type art that you've seen in the world, uh, and you could be inspired by what particular painter or something like this. And I think we need to get to a way where the way we train models get to something similar for new creation. Like you can have inspiration from things you've seen, and so for a model, it's things you've been trained on, but then they have to, it has to be made in a way that is not too close to you know, being a copy, because then, then you get into copyright issues. So there's a risk, but I think with the right care, we can manage that. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. I hear this kind of concern of job destruction coming up quite a bit everywhere, you know, on the forum as well. And so, Emmanuel, I think that a lot of people might be really curious to hear what um, your response would be to concerns about AI taking away work from developers or agency services and, and you know, where they're building for others. I mean, as I said uh, a few minutes ago in terms of risk, I mean, that's definitely something that is top of mind for us. Like, the last thing we want is to undermine uh, the businesses of agencies in our and freelancers in our ecosystem. What I would say, though, is that the penetration of software in general is still really low, actually. Like, it's not necessarily obvious here because we're in New York and everyone here is extremely tech-minded. But in the world, like, there are so many places, so many institutions, companies, uh, it's very small, business, small businesses that do need software and could be operating better with software and more efficiently, and basically everyone would be happy with it, that I think there is a pool from the market that is going to keep request, requiring us to generate more software and applications for them. And so I, I think, we, we, we'll all, again, we'll all be fine. Like, there's still going to be a business, and instead it's going to be an opportunity for everyone here and everyone in our ecosystem to produce more on the same amount of time uh, without, I think, fulfilling the demand for a very long time. I mean, it's interesting, I was looking at some of the, the uh, first of all, I think Microsoft did a fantastic job of branding here. I think Copilot is a really good way to talk about yeah. AI. And they did a bunch of studies of looking at development teams that use Copilot and, you know, do you end up with less developers or more? And, like, basically nobody shrinks their developers because of it. They just become more productive, um, which should seem obvious. Like, that, you know, every time writing code has gotten easier, I mean, there's a time when we didn't have debuggers. There's a time when we, I mean, there's, we've come a long way from punch cards. You know, we've only we've only created more work for developers. So I, I think we're going to see, you know, an explosion of jobs for uh, the tool set is easier. I love the lower floor to get started, higher ceiling of what you can do. I think we're going to see quite the opposite. No, I, I mean I, I I agree with that, and I I think that your point, Emmanuel, about all the the frictions in our everyday life and work that haven't been solved with software yet. I mean, if you think about it, until now, we've relied on a company to get scale, focus on a particular function and a particular practice in order to remove the friction of it, which has obviously like, reduced the set of things that actually make it to all of us. Whereas I think we're going to a world where, especially with some of the low-code solutions out there, I won't name names, but we can actually solve, you know, we can, we can just generate software that solves any of these problems in the stack. And I mean, there's so much friction we all deal with still every day in, yep. in our work and lives. So I, I think that when you can free up some development capacity from some of like the central things we've chosen so far and, you know, and then, then attack the long tail of other opportunities, I think we're going to see far more companies and far more solutions um, that are really viable businesses, actually. Yeah, these definitely really help with the concerns. And honestly, one of the main reasons that these concerns exist in the first place is because these models are really good. And there's quite a bit of benefit that we've already seen as to what these models can bring us. And so I would love to talk a little bit more about that and what you consider to be the most valuable applications of AI at your company, in, in your product, or even personally. Um, yeah, I can start. I mean, I think the... Um, yeah, first off, the, the AI systems we're seeing today are amazing. They're hugely forward uh, from, from where we were a few years back. Um, there has been 
steady progress over the years before that as well that I think has, that we're all building on top of. Um, you know, for us, I think the, we've sort of classified the types of things we're seeing in three big buckets, knowledge assistance, writing assistance, and task assistance. So a lot of what we're seeing in Coda is, um, you know, it, maybe just as a backgrounder, Coda is an all-in-one doc. It blends documents, spreadsheets, presentations, applications all in one surface. Um, but one of the biggest things that it is known for is that we integrate with a lot of systems. And so uh, there's about 600 different, we call them packs, that have been developed for Coda. And so very typically people connect Coda to Salesforce or Jira or all, many, mostly internal applications, although there's some external ones as well. Um, and so we'll see Coda get used as a knowledge assistant, you know, tell me what's happening, not just in my documents, but across my company. Um, a writing assistant that actually knows what, what you're working on. So it's, you know, generate a spec for this feature, knowing what else we're working on. And then a task assistant that can go and automate things across these systems and say, uh, I want to be able to perform this task. Um, you know, a, a very common examples tend to be communication and summarization. Um, so we see lots of, I've got all this user research, how do I make sense of it? Uh, we see lots of communication examples of, I've got a long list of customers in Salesforce, generate an email to each one, send it out, take the response, generate something back. So those are, those are the types of use cases we see a lot of. Yeah, I mean, actually a lot of similar things, and because you're asking about the tools that we use you know, to make, and, uh, and we've benefited from some of the summarization stuff for sure. You know, we're playing, uh, we have an Acro the Acrobat product, and so we're actually playing a lot with uh, integrating agent-assisted experiences to navigate your documents, and we use that internally. We're kind of like dogfooding that a lot, a lot with our with ourselves now. But the the other thing I was just going to say is, you know, it's not as sort of a fun of a topic, but security, you know, is uh, is when you when you have an at scale operation, just threat detection and and AI is really amazing at this because there's so much data and patterns, whether it's badge access or. I mean, security for the company, security for our customers, security for data. It's, it's exciting to, to think about the, um, the role that AI can play in all of that, and we're going to need that. You know, I'm actually excited when we have some sort of the local AI stuff running on our devices that tell us, avoid that phone call, that's a phishing attempt, or you know, that email, don't open this email. I mean, there's a lot of things that AI can do to protect us every day. Um, maybe even can tell us that something is likely fake when we see media that can help us be smarter uh, and combat the bad use cases of AI that we talked about earlier. Yeah, in the bubble world, um, I mean, as we've announced this morning, like generating uh, web pages and helping people with design, which is one of the things where we see most of friction from people, and it can be pretty tedious, uh, is a first step. But where I think things getting really, really exciting is for the actual complicated logic, which is something that uh, can take a lot of learning, and so if we can accelerate how much people uh, can grasp the tool and understand how to use it, and generate these uh, backend workflows to be very specific to the bubble language, uh, that is uh, really exciting. Other things that, you know, down the line that would be very exciting, which is a little bit like summarizing things, but in the bubble world, is, you know, like pointing on something in, a, in an app and asking, you know, what does it do? You know, like explain in plain English what this workflow does, which as we think about company scaling on us and collaboration and having multiple people touching uh, the same application can be uh, extremely exciting. At a personal level, what I use AI the most is for summarizing, <laughs> actually. Yeah. Summarizing, yeah, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Emmanuel yeah. and Scott, I really enjoyed hearing about your personal uses of AI, Shashir. What is your kind of favorite personal use of AI? Oh, <laughs> I, I, have a, I have a little secret one. <laughs> um, so we have a, uh, it's kind of a fun one, but we had a, I got inspired to this ritual from um, a guy named Nick Mehta. He's the founder of Gainsight. Mm -hmm. And he has this goal of meeting 500 customers a year, which I think is like an interesting goal for a CEO. Um, and the way he does it is he does this thing called ghost emails, where he's this list of templates that anyone on his team can ask him to send to a customer. It's, you know, And some are like, hey, new customer. Here's an email from the CEO. You know, Here's a customer that's like in trouble. But more interesting ones are like, this person just switched jobs. Send them, send them an email. Um, and the way he did it was he would set these templates up. People would send it to his admin. His admin would like respond, help him get better, send it to him. He'd look at it to make it look better. It was just like this long process for doing it. Um, and so we ended up building a similar system we call ghost emails. And basically, someone gives the prompt. I have a list of these are, these are things you can start with the seeds. 
um, the AI system goes and takes that, merges it with a bunch of information that I already know about the person. Oh, I'm meeting this person this, you know, in in two weeks, or I just met them, or here's the last interaction, or here's something about the here's something about um, someone else I may know at the company, and it generates that email, sticks it in a review queue, I approve, and it goes out. And I went from sending two or three of these a month. I think last month I sent 300. Um, and it's just a very effective way to scale what still feels like very personal communication. So if any of you receive an email from me like this, you know, don't, don't be. <laughs> now we know. <laughs> <laughs> now you know where it might have come from. But, yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. It's pretty clear that there's some really amazing AI, uh, methods that different products are using to integrate AI with all kinds of project, uh, products in creative ways. Mm -hmm. So why don't we zoom out just for a second for this kind of one discussion point. What influence do you think that AI will have on the types of companies that take off and have success in the years ahead? Well, I think, so in terms of the landscape of the types of companies that will take off as the result of AI, yeah. Um, I mean, there's a, this is a fascinating debate right now, right? So you have how many major LLMs are in the market now? At least five, probably more, you know, and, and growing every day. Uh, some of them are interchangeable, and you know, and I think there's services being built on them. And I, I wonder whether some of them will be commoditized to some degree or not. I think there's questions about what, what can run locally versus what's in the cloud, and how you route a customer's need to a more efficient model. I think right now everyone's focused on better, better, better models as opposed to like efficiency. But I think that's going to become a thing at some point soon, where cost is going to matter, and a lot of the things we need won't be needing GPT-8 or whatever it will be up to by then. Like we just can we can get it done. You know, more simply and maybe even locally. Um, so I think that's super interesting. Uh, I think companies will, there will be a long tail of very specialty models. You know, we're building things for imaging and video and 3D and, you know, but we're not building our own LLM because we have great LLM partners to work with. So companies need to kind of focus on what they can bring a competitive advantage to. And, uh, and I think if there's, if there's something we're not sort of talking about yet, but you know, what will soon, like, or what are, the, what are the prodigies and CompuServes of this era? What are the ones that we're celebrating now as companies that are maybe, maybe like single point solutions that are going to dissipate, you know, and not be like there for the long run? And of the companies that really make it, how important will the interfaces be? I've always felt like in some weird way, the internet is this giant game of slap a hand, where like whoever's on top wins at the end of the day. And, uh, and so you're building models, you're building interfaces on top of models, and you're building audio versions that just, you know, use your voice. And then there's like, you know, and, and where do they win? Like what interfaces in the home? What interface at work? It's just one, one view, I think, that we, we don't talk as much about like the design, designer's role in making some of these AI solutions really stick. But I think that's going to become more important as time passes. Maybe I'll, I'll pick uh, something that, Maybe more directly for this audience, I think um, when I worked on YouTube, we used to draw the analogy a lot that online video or YouTube would do to cable what cable did to broadcast, mm. and that we're going to go from three channels to 300 channels to 3 million channels. And I remember the first time I made that statement, I was at a conference, not that much bigger than this one actually in New York, and I, I kind of got laughed out of the room. People's view, this is in 2008, and people's view was like, why would you need more than 300 cable channels? It just seemed like kind of crazy. Uh, there's already a whole bunch of them, nobody watches, and so on. And uh, I think they just, most of the people just misunderstood human creativity. And what happened, of course, over the last 15 years is that's exactly what's happened now. We have millions of these channels, um, many of them filling niches that we didn't think were, you know, you may not have thought were interesting. I mean, who knew that there would be an explosion of channels that are teaching you how to use Photoshop? That's an example, but that turns out, like, could you have put that on TV back in 2008? Probably not. Um, and you know, I get asked a lot about how I went from YouTube to Coda because it seems different to people. But for me, it actually seems very similar. We're sort of building a set of creative tools for people to be able to build solutions for themselves. And the the today, the software landscape is mostly a few hundred software vendors that have kind of built one thing for everybody. They're the cable channels of of today. And so the to use that analogy, just talking to um, I don't know how many people here have kids and know who Mr. Beast is. Um, but Mr. Beast is about to be the first YouTuber to make a billion dollars on the platform. Back in 2008, that sounded crazy. Um, but now it seems like really obvious that there's going to be many of those to happen. And I think in the software world, I think it's just about, you know, we're just seeing that happening. And, and so I think we're going to see this explosion of 
needs of what people want and of applications. And we're going to see instead of building one big CRM company called Salesforce, we're going to build millions of them and have lots and lots of different ones for different industries or different specific companies or specific users or, or so on. So I think, I think that's, we're going to see a much broader, longer tail of companies that's probably analogous to what happened to cable. Hmm. I mean, I think this is the best pitch for Bob and AI. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, that's really, yeah, that's what we, I'm hoping to see, is to see, like, you know, millions of applications solving really particular needs. I think the SaaS trend that we've had over the last 10 years was really about, you know, one major SaaS provider solving problems for most people, but never, never perfectly. And I think here we have an opportunity, combining AI and no code in particular, to generate tailored solutions for really unique problems for like what you would call like a micro vertical or micro SaaS, much more than what we've seen today, uh, which I think will, will end up being better for er really everyone. It's gonna decentralize the power to create even more and for people to have actual product that is exactly what they need uh, to solve their problems. Yeah, very interesting. I think all of you at this point have touched on this idea of creativity and how AI affects creativity. And as we continue to use ChatGPT to design, to build, to kind of improve an idea that we're working on, some people might have the concern that you know, creativity is, our ability to be creative is getting weaker as we rely on these models. And I would love to hear more about your thoughts about this kind of intersection of creativity and using AI and our muscles of creativity. My take is that AI is, and again, you're right, I mean, Microsoft came with a great name with Copilot. Like, these tools are really helping us getting somewhere, but I still think, you know, having a human behind it, actually tweaking things and making sure this is exactly what they have in mind uh, when they realize whether it's an application or uh, an image or a text or anything uh, is, is really important. And so creativity, creativity will still be there. I don't think creativity has gone down over time uh, over the last centuries because technology got better. In fact, I think we have been more creative. I mean, to the YouTube example, there have been more content created because it's now easier to create content. And I think we'll see, we'll see the same thing here. What we want to make sure is that, as I was saying earlier, like we don't want all things to look the same. Uh, and in Bubble in particular, we don't want all applications to look the same. But if we manage to make sure this does not happen, then the creative mind behind uh, his computer or their computer when it's about creating something will be able to express themselves in a great way. It's interesting. I feel like I have kind of the opposite concern because I feel like you know, every, every AI system has a, a set of settings for it, a lot of them call it temperature, that actually forces creativity. Like the natural thing an AI system is supposed to do, that LLMs are supposed to do, is take an average of what everybody has ever said or done and give you the next thing that everybody would say or do. So we all should say or do the same thing. You actually have to force it to be creative. So I actually think the, the, uh, it's going to put a premium on a new type of creativity. And like what we call hallucinations is actually kind of a, like you said, as a feature that way. But we have to force these systems to say, actually, don't say what everybody would say. Like, why don't you like bend a little bit out of that space um, differently? Um, I have a, my older daughter, 17, flying to college now. And there's like lots of debate about ChatGPT and, and college students. And everybody does, that doesn't think students are sitting with, you know, some version of an AI client open while they're writing their essays is totally nuts. But it's interesting what it does, because it actually, if you, everybody's presumption is it's going to just write the essays for it. It's actually quite terrible at writing essays for you. But it's really good at building variations of your ideas. And so we'll often see ourselves take like a concept, you'll know, select a sentence, and you say generate, you know, 20 different variations of this. That it can be quite good at if you force it to do it. But, by, but if you don't force it to do it, it's actually quite generic. It's actually good, not, not particularly good. Um, so I, I think it's going to take some work for us to, use it in a way that creates instead of conforms. You know, when you, when you talk to a creative professional and you ask them what, what, what determines how good their solution will be, it's ultimately time. You know, they want to have time to explore various solutions. So if any of you have ever worked with an agency for brand development and they come and give you that deck with like two or three solutions that you choose from, they had a sprint, right, where they probably had five ideas and they whittled it down to three. But if they can make, if they can, with the power of AI, if they could actually work so much more effectively and faster that they can explore 30 ideas and whittle it down to three, they'll have a better three because they'll have better solutions to consider. They'll have more time, essentially, through the superpower, right, that they get. And so I, I think that 
when, you know, when a creative has an idea, there's just so much friction. There's such a long experience from that in their minds to being visualized. And for that to be truncated dramatically allows them to really like cycle through a lot of the ideas that are still very human. Um, but I also have to say that the human part of it will be the differentiator. I mean, there's a, there's a video uh, guy, a vlogger, very popular YouTube guy named Casey Neistat that some of you also probably know based in New York, and he did this experiment with ChatGPT um, where he actually had it write a script that Casey Neistat would do. And he went through New York City doing one of his vlogs that always become very, like, you know, popular on, on YouTube. And he did this, you know, with but just following the script word for word. And uh, it was really weird. Like, in random places in New York, he'd be like, hey, guys, like, this is where I come to get my inspiration. And it would just be like an escalator going down slowly, you know? And uh, after this video, he turns to the camera for, like, this post-mortem, which he doesn't typically do, and he said, listen, that was the worst video I ever made in my life. And I think the reason is because it had no soul. And I was thinking, like, what does soul mean? Does it mean, like, the counterintuitive stuff? Does it mean the, you know, the, the, the extra glance that you know what the person really intends, but it's not even said with words? And it's, those are the things that are going to ultimately make these experiences... Uh, compel us to do things, to have emotion. And uh, so I don't think, you know, one thing that's always been true is that creativity that is effective is creativity that moves us. And I don't think that's going to change. Thank you. Yeah, as we're coming up on time, I'll um, end us with one final question. No code is progressing very fast, clearly, as we see through these leaders on stage. And so is AI. Where do you see the intersection of no code and AI in five years? Well, one of us is most qualified to answer this yeah. question. <laughs> well, I, I was about to say, uh, I, hope, I hope in five years we don't even talk about AI and no code. It's just a blend, you know, like, you know, these two technologies blend together and just becomes like a natural language medium to build uh, things and get things generated. And, and AI just becomes like the underlying technology, as there are many technologies we're using today, but not necessarily the things that are the most top of mind. Uh, at, at, at least in, in the bubble world, that's, that's what I hope we're, we're heading to. I, I was going to riff some similar idea. Uh, my my father is a is and was a computer scientist, and uh, he used to tell me when I went to college and I was uh, going to do a research project in the AI group, and he said, "Oh, why would you bother with the AI group?" This was back in 1996, and and uh, I said, "Why not?" And he said, "Well, AI is you know, all the things that don't work." And I said, "What do you mean?" He says, "Well, anytime anything actually works in AI, it kind of moves out of the AI group." And it's like, you know, all these things that we figured out over the years um, and, you know, uh, oh, that's just a regression or that's just, you know, when you come to a traffic light, how's it decide red or green? Oh, this is the algorithm. Once you understand the algorithm, it doesn't sound like AI anymore. And I suspect what happened in the last few years is we kind of went the opposite way. We took a bunch of things that actually are, um, you know, perhaps wouldn't have been labeled AI before and it's become a very important term. But I suspect that a lot of these features... Um, I mean, using Photoshop as an example, I mean, you guys just added an amazing set of features, but the last set of features were also pretty magical. <laughs> they were also like, but well, we just stopped calling them AI because it didn't seem like we kind of understood what it did now. And, and so I suspect that we're going to see this as just like the obvious, you know, in, in, in my space, we call it the new spell check. Is that the spell check AI, of course it's AI. The grammar check AI, of course it's AI. It's like, in fact, where did the yellow lump come from? They came from a translation team that was trying to figure out how to translate better, deal, deal with grammar better, like it is absolutely AI. But we don't call spell check and grammar check AI. And so I suspect we're going to see more and more of these things feel like the obvious features of our tool sets. And you know, new, we, we just got new, to use the analogy from Scott's world, we all got new paintbrushes um, that are you know, a little bit better than they used to be. I guess one other thought I would just add, because I agree with all these, is, um, is just the empowerment for small businesses. You know, I, a lot of the conversation around AI is oftentimes, oh, the big companies, the incumbents, the ones with the models. But the fact that a lot of small businesses can now have customer service departments, creative departments, like all of these capabilities augmented by AI that they ordinarily couldn't afford. In some ways, small businesses are getting some of the superpowers that were only available and accessible to big companies. And so what will that look like? I mean, maybe we'll have tons and tons of small businesses with smaller numbers of people, but with global reach. 
Um, you know, anything can be localized now automatically. Like, there's so many implications for all this. So I, I do hope that when we think about the future of low code and also AI, like that helps drive this sort of small business revolution, which I think will be also good for the economy. It's a pretty exciting future ahead of us. Unfortunately, that is all the time that we have. Thank you so much, Scott, Tashir, and Emmanuel, for joining us today and sharing your perspectives on AI and no code. Uh, thank you all for joining here today. <laughs>